<laughs> First to face the dragons are Lee Denny and Julia Le. Deep breath in, deep breath out. Go. Every would-be scout knows the importance of being prepared. And Lee and Julia have spent a decade in muddy fields as groundwork for today. We'd both been working in festivals and music for 10 years and we were trying to think of an entirely new experience that gave people the chance to come away with more than just a hangover. Oh, it looks great. Looks like my cup of tea, whatever it is. I'd love to do that. Unfortunately, having suffered a fractured wrist, Deborah Meaden will just have to park the pottery dream for now. But that doesn't stop her from being the entrepreneur's favoured dragon. I would really like to work with Deborah Meaden. I'm hearing the music from Ghost. <laughs> what is it, Unchained <laughs> Melody? <laughs> Just close your eyes and imagine, Deborah. She's got a really great background in holiday camps and her ethics just seem really, really aligned with what we do. Hi, I'm Julia Lowe. And I'm Lee Denny. And we are the founders of Camp Wildfire, the UK's first summer camp for adults. We are offering a 5% stake in our business in return for a £75,000 investment. At Camp Wildfire, you adventure by day and you party by night. Your ticket includes a choice of over 100 activities and 50 bands and DJs. You'll spend your days driving quad bikes, firing arrows, climbing trees and building rafts. And as night falls, you'll feast on banquets, party in the forest and cosy up around campfires. This year, we have two sold out events and are about to launch a third. We will turn over 1.8 million and anticipate net profits of 315,000. So we'd just like to say thank you to Matt. He's just showing you one of the examples of the kind of activities you can do at Camp Wildfire. We'd also like to thank Danny. We have a cocktail making workshop at the event. He's gonna bring you a cocktail now. Summer Camps for Adults is the brainchild of Lee Denny and Julia Lowe. Everybody at Camp Wildfire gets given an enamel mug on the way in. Thank you very much. Uh, this is so we don't have to use any disposable plastics. They're seeking a £75,000 investment in return for 5% of their company. And it appears Sarah Davies is quite taken with the idea of daytime adventures and nighttime partying. Hey guys, this sounds <laughs> brilliant. I was actually going to ask you about your target market and the demographic that you're hitting. So m most people coming tend to be aged 30 to 45. It tends to be people that have been to a couple of festivals before. Now they want something a little bit more engaging. They want to go away, having learned some new skills and feeling really good about themselves. So what does it cost me for an individual ticket for the weekend? We have three different ticket prices. We have an elementary ticket, which is £245. Mm -hmm. That comes with 60 activity credits and all the kind of bands and DJs. A standard ticket, that's 295 and that comes with 120 activity credits. And then we have a dynamo version, which comes with unlimited activity credits. And last question from me, how do I book on have you still got any availability <laughs> this year? Yes. We can sort you out. <laughs> An activity-packed weekend under canvas could be just the ticket for Sarah Davies. Deborah Meaden now wants to arm herself with the Dapper Duo's financials. I've never seen grown-ups look so good in their sky type bits, though. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so let's talk about some numbers. Do you want to take me through what you've already done, then? We were established in 2015. Between 2015 and 2019, we were making net losses of around 10 to 20,000 per year. That's normal for an event brand. It takes three, five years to, to get going and to get to that break-even point. Really excitingly for us, 2019, 2020 financial year, we'd sold out 2,000 tickets. Uh, we'd turned over 600,000, or w would have turned over 600,000. We would have made a 100,000 pound profit. Unfortunately, due to COVID, we weren't able to run our events that year. Uh, we've managed to come back stronger this year. We've already sold 1.3 million's worth of tickets and we should make 315,000 net profit. So what does the balance sheet look like? As of today, 
I don't know because we're still working out all the COVID losses. I know, I know it's been a really tough year. Yeah, because it's a tough year is the very year you should be on it. When it's tough and things are going wrong, you've got to be all over your numbers. Yeah. Some in-depth dragon delving reveals that the event planning pair have a shaky grasp of their current festival's finances. Now, Stephen Bartlett wants to find out more about the man and woman beneath the badges. What are your backgrounds? So my background is in graphic design. That's actually how Lee and I met. So Lee was running festivals for many years and I was his graphic designer. Yeah, um, I started my first festival business at the age of 16 in my back garden when my parents went away on holiday. And they said, you're not allowed to have a house party. So me and my friends had a festival instead. That festival ran for 10 years and was very successful. And you sold it or? It was actually run as a non-profit festival. So me and my friends started it primarily to support music in our local area. And then it just kind of kicked off. It grew to about 2,500 attendees over the course of 10 years. Um, uh, but we were all working on it voluntarily. So it just kind of ran its course. Uh, and then, then we closed down the company. We gave all the money to charity. Um, yeah, and how much was it? How much did you give? Sorry, uh, I think some years we made a loss, so we didn't actually end up uh, being able to give money to charity. Other years we gave four or five thousand pounds. So that was basically a, a festival and a business, but it didn't make any money and you just closed it? Well, I think because we couldn't get the ticket prices high enough um, to compete on lineup with a lot of the big guys. Whereas with this, this is completely unique, which is why people are willing to pay a premium ticket price for it. But the thing is, you haven't, you haven't done this yet, have you? We yes, have. We've, we've run it for five years. Yeah. In 2015 was our first event. So you've got five years to 19, and specifically on that year, how much net profit? Net loss, 10,000. OK, then you have the pandemic. Your hands are tied. Yep. And now this year, yes, you've taken people's money, mm -hmm. yep. but you still haven't run a festival, still haven't made money. So right up until now, you haven't demonstrated that you can run a festival and make money. Um, is that fair statement? I guess, yeah, that's a fair statement. I'm giving you a hard time because you've come in at a £1.5 million valuation just because you've sold tickets to an event you haven't done yet. We have done it. Well, you haven't? Yeah, not this year, but... We haven't done it this year, and the year that you did do it, you lost money. From where I'm sitting, I just don't see this as a business opportunity. So, for that reason, I'm out. Ticket sales for future events aren't enough to satisfy Peter Jones, who decamps from the deal. While a luxury-loving Tuka Suleiman has a confession to make. Guys, I've never been camping. Have you not? No. no. Wow. So, first it comes into my mind is, do I get a shower, bed, ensuite? What do you offer for the money you're receiving? So with your ticket comes a, a space in our general camping, which is free. Right. Or we have other options. So there's a pre-pitched tent camping, which is a slightly more expensive on top of your ticket. We have holiday camping, which is vintage uh, frame tents. Yeah. Or there's boutique camping, which is the proper beds, the bell tent, you know, the whole shebang. So yeah. that's I easy. would have thought I'd read one of these big vans, all luxury. Yeah, you yeah, could yeah. do that as well. Oh, right. You could also hire somebody as well, too, to do the activities yeah. for you. <laughs> <laughs> So, how many people do you have on each event? 2,000. It's not intimate. I can see myself coming down to your camp, one look and I'm out of there. <laughs> 2,000 people, that would drive me crazy. This is a business for somebody that knows what they're doing. Mm -hmm. This is not a product where you ring up a, a retailer and say, we want to get your product in. It's very different. And for that reason, I'm out. Okay, thank you, Tika. Thank you. Lee, Julia. When I look at the concept that you presented today, it doesn't get me, like, tremendously excited. And I find that difficult as an investment because I wouldn't want to come. And I think you need an investor that would want to be there, swinging on your zip lines and making your pots. Unfortunately, that's not me. And for that reason, I'm going to say that I'm out. I would swing on the zip wire and make the <laughs> pots. I just think he's a bit young. You're a bit young, so... Maybe, <laughs> yeah. maybe. I love the concept. I love the business. I actually run probably the biggest craft retreat um, in the country. 
and it is hard work, really hard work. And 10 years we've slogged away at that and still haven't managed to, to make it make money. So I can't invest a day and I'm out. Sarah Davies knows all too well that the event business can be resource heavy, but profit light, and becomes the fourth dragon out. Deborah Meaden is the entrepreneur's last chance of investment, but also their favored dragon. Has she heard anything to elicit an offer? So guys, I really like it. Thank you. When I was in the holiday park industry, people coming in and providing a wow piece for my customers was absolute gold dust, you know. So I can clearly see what we could do with this. But there are some serious structural problems you've got ahead of you, and you need help. But I can offer help practically, I don't think I need to tell you, because I think you know full well what my background is. Yes. So I'm going to make you an offer. I'm going to offer you all of the money, yep. and I want 25% of the business, which I think is a much more realistic valuation. Thank you. <laughs> Do you mind if we just have a couple of minutes to I discuss? go and have a chat yep. behind Thank the you. trees. Yeah, yeah In exactly. the woodland. Deborah Meaden thinks the festival idea has a real USP and tables a bid. Oh, obviously, Deborah's amazing. But I just think that we don't want to give away too much now. What do you think? But in return for the £75,000 the duo is seeking, she wants five times more than the 5% of equity that they're willing to give away. What do you think is a decent number to go for? And it appears the pair have a new proposition to put to her. So, um, thank you very much for your offer. Um, we would like to ask if it would be possible to do 20%. And if we hit our numbers, which we believe we can, in the next season that we run, 315,000, would you be willing to roll back to the 5% that we pitched? 5%? No. That kind of misses the point, because if I'm having an impact on this business, then I'll be part of the you achieving your 315,000. I mean, it, yep, it, it's, illo it's completely illogical. So no is the answer. OK. Would you be willing to uh, do 20% for 75,000? Do you know, in your last counteroffer, I've got to tell you, I nearly fell off my chair. And that really worried me. OK. I'm getting insights into how you are going to be when you go out there and you do business. And do you know what? I'm afraid I withdraw my offer. I'm out. OK. OK, thank you. All right, thank you for your time. Lee and Julia must leave the den with nothing. Well, as a disgruntled Deborah Meaden takes the highly unusual step of curtailing the negotiations. I'm shocked you did that, but I'm not surprised at all. It was completely wrong thinking. Mm. We had discussed in advance that the maximum we wanted to give away was 10%. So to have an offer like 25% just felt like too high an offer to me. Yeah. It is a good product. Obviously, you, you hope to go in and get five offers, but, I mean, it's a negotiation. Sometimes negotiations don't work out. 